Hi, I'm Carrie Fancett Pagels, the author of Dogwood Plantation, and I'm pleased to read my prologue today and a little bit of chapter one for you. Prologue. Dogwood Plantation, Charles City, Virginia, 1814. Cornelia trembled in the open door to the plantation owner's bedroom, a handkerchief covering her face. Not much protection against yellow fever, but something. Lee Williams lay still, paler even, even than Papa had been at the end in what was about to become the Dogwood Plantation owner's deathbed. Miss Gill, Lee's voice rasped like a dry corn husk scraping over a tabletop. Her knees shook harder. She daren't go any closer. She had to think of her brother Andy, too. This pestilence spread quickly, far too fast. She'd been summoned home from her position in Richmond only two weeks earlier, but it felt nigh unto an eternity with all the illness and death. Yes, bring Carter home. Her hands joined her knees in wobbling. If she made this promise, could she live with the consequences? And how would she get to Williamsburg? She couldn't go on her own. Promise me. Lee struggled to lift his head and began to cough. She took two steps back, ready to run. Someone grabbed her shoulders and she jumped, the handkerchief slipping from her face. Miss Gill, you got to go get Master Carter. Nimi, the Williams's house servant, quickly released Cornelia's shoulders. Sorry, miss, but she was about to knock me plumb over. The heavy set woman took two steps back and lingered in the hallway. Cornelia covered her nose and mouth again and faced a dying man who was only a handful of years older than herself. Lee's wife, Anne, had died only days earlier. Their past of children were isolated in their rooms upstairs. I will go and get Carter. Never mind that her father's body had just been laid in the grave with no funeral and no words spoken over him other than what she and Andy had managed. What a terrible way to part with their beloved father. Charles City County had never seen the likes of this outbreak of yellow fever. The epidemic struck in all classes from the wealthy, like Lee Williams and his wife, to the poor slaves in the fields. She'd picked herself up. She'd pick herself up and do what she had to do. Now, Lee's light eyes pleaded. It wasn't me who sent you away. Cornelia raised her hand, her eyes moistening at his use of her childhood nickname. Shush, it doesn't matter now. Lee closed his eyes. All that pain of separation from Carter. Even with the hateful things Roger Williams had said to justifying sending Cornelia to Richmond and away from Papa and Andy, this horrific yellow fever epidemic and the war had wiped away her anger at Lee and Carter's father. And anger at Carter, too, if she was honest with herself. She had to let that go. Those little boys upstairs had no one to care for them now except their Uncle Carter, and she'd not let them down. Nimi shuffled forward. Missy, you tell them schoonermen to take you to get Master Carter. Yes, she could have those men who are well enough to sail take her to Williamsburg. She nodded. I'll take care of Master Lee. Nimi shook her head slowly. Won't be long now, Missy. Cornelia drew in a shuddering breath. God, grant Lee a, a peaceful passage home to glory. Do you think the people outside of Charles City know about the contagion? Will they even allow us in port? The good Lord gonna help you bring Master Carter home. I know it in my heart. Nimi pressed a hand to her chest. As Cornelia turned to go, she could have sworn she heard Nimi mutter. He need to be here for you too. Had she imagined it or had the servant spoken aloud the same words in Cornelia's own heart? She left the house and hurried across the vast dogwood plantation property to her own home. She'd get her brother Andy and begin their journey. She didn't want to leave the grieving 12-year-old alone. As she approached the cabin, she spied her brother. Oh, Andy, Mr. Lee is at the end. Andy swiped at his tears. We need to go to the college, and I'll need you to go into the men's dormitory for me to get Carter. Will you tell him, though? Yes. She didn't need that duty to land on her brother's young shoulders. 
They went into the cabin and gathered a few items to carry with them and headed out. An icy cloak of despair settled on Cornelia's shoulders as she and her brother hurried past the catalpas that edged their property, the tall trees frond-like leaves waving. The same breeze that stirred the branches would hurry them toward Williamsburg once they were aboard the schooner and would place her face to face with the one man she couldn't bear to see again. Chapter 1, Williamsburg, Virginia How did one plan a future when the world was crumbling around them? Carter Williams tapped his fingers on the long wooden table that served as his and his peers' desk, trying to focus his attention on his law professor. The College of William and Mary Law School had been his original plan, but that plan had inc included Cornelia Gill at his side. Since he'd spied her in Richmond several weeks earlier, her visage preoccupied his reveries. He exhaled a slow breath. Instead of daydreaming of what he'd lost, he should spend time praying for his former crewmates still at sea. Beside him, Ethan Randolph whispered, Have you heard that Bonaparte might soon be defeated? Carter nodded in what he hoped was an imperceptible manner. He didn't need their professor shouting at him today. Randolph, like Carter, had mustered out of the Navy with injuries. More British ships will thus be directed toward America. He dipped his chin slightly. He was tempted to pray about that, but God didn't seem to listen anymore. Carter rubbed his painful leg, a daily reminder of his own fragile humanity. 26 years old and now disabled from serving his country. The ornamental sword they'd awarded him for bravery had done nothing to erase his injury. Professor Danner's robes brushed Carter's arm as he strode down the aisle and paused at the next row. Here at the second oldest institution of learning in our country, we expect law students to remain awake. A loud thwack echoed in Carter's ears. His classmate, John Bradley, awoke and jerked upright. A sharp rap on the wooden dais startled him. Mr. Williams, what think you of the act proposed to re-examine the Kentucky and Virginia borders? An image of Daniel Scott dragging Nell across the Virginia line and into Kentucky surged through Carter's mind. Sweat beaded on his forehead. I believe it shall go forward and the Indians will be stripped of their rights. Twas Professor Danner's own position. If Carter were to become an elected official, how would he persuade his constituents that such a move was morally wrong? An intelligent fellow you are, Mr. Williams. The professor's bushy eyebrows rose as he sought other quarry. Mr. Randolph, could you elaborate on why Mr. Williams might be correct? What was Daniel Scott's position on the matter? he left long ago and was rumored to practice law in Kentucky. What an irony that would be if the miscreant was now involved in politics. Carter unclenched the fists that he hadn't realized he had made. Daniel no longer posed a threat to himself or to Nell. Yellow fever was the Williams' enemy, not Daniel. Thankfully, his brother and sister-in-law wrote that they were taking appropriate precautions for, to protect themselves from the scourge. Professor Danner pointed his stick at Bradley, who seemed quite alert now. Give us some air in here. Bradley rose and opened the mullion windows on the far wall, allowing a crisp breeze to enter. As a gust filled the first floor room, students smacked their hands down on their papers, securing them to their desks. Carter spied a dray lurching down Richmond Road adjacent to the building. He stiffened. Certain he recognized the wagon as his family's own, kept at the Williamsburg Wharf. He struggled to stand, hoping to secure a better look. Yellow blonde curls, like corn silk, identified the driver as Cornelia Gill. A boy sat beside Nell, her brother, Andrew. His heart beat the staccato sound of a drumbeat, readying for war. Oh, Lord, please, no. Someone in Carter's family must have died. He could fathom no other reason for her arrival. She wouldn't have sailed down from Charles City were it not for some grave purpose. His legs trembling, he clutched the desktop and lowered himself into his seat. Mr. Williams, are you unwell? Professor Danner held his Elmwood pointer high. Tis my family's conveyance on the road. Carter loosened his collar and dabbed at the perspiration on his forehead. I must beg your leave, sir. 
Indeed, you may have it. Professor Danner gestured to the door. Thank you, sir. Carter steadied his cane beneath him and grabbed his haversack before easing down the aisle and out the door. If you have given me another burden to bear, I shan't speak to you at all, ever.